The Bridge on the River Kwai is a 1957 epic war film based on the 1952 novel The Bridge Over the River Kwai. The plot is based on the construction in 1942 of one of the railway bridges over the Mekong River in Thailand. The author of the book had been a prisoner of the Japanese in Southeast Asia, and the story was based on his experiences with some French officers, but he chose to use British officers in the book. His creation of the character of Lieutenant Colonel Nicholson was not based on the actual Allied senior officer at the Mekong Bridge named Philip Tuzi, but his Nicholson character was actually a conglomeration of his memories of several collaborating French officers. The novel then addresses, therefore, the dilemma of the British prisoners of war that were forced by the Imperial Japanese Army to build a bridge as part of the 250-mile Burma Railway. It became better known as the Death Railway because 15,000 prisoners and 100,000 forced laborers had died during its construction from 1942 to 1943. The popularity of the novel caught the attention of American producer and screenwriter Carl Foreman. He would be the first to attempt an adaptation of the novel to a screenplay. He had come across the book when he moved to England after being blacklisted in his Native America. Before he had a finished product, there were actually three rewrites of the screenplay, including one by the film's director, David Lean. The eventual screenwriters, Carl Foreman and Michael Wilson, were both on Hollywood's blacklist. And even though they were living in exile in England, they could only work on the film in secret. The two never did collaborate on the script. Wilson took over after producer Sam Spiegel expressed the dissatisfaction that he had with Lean's attempt at the script. Now, because Foreman and Wilson both had been blacklisted from Hollywood because of their communist ties, their work went uncredited. The sole writing credit, and therefore the Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay, went to the author, Pierre Boyol. And I hope I'm pronouncing that last name right. I'm probably not. And he received the award even though he didn't have anything to do with writing the English script. This became a long-running controversy between the Academy and the true authors. Finally, in 1984, the Academy retroactively awarded the Oscar to Wilson and Foreman. Sadly, Wilson did not live to see this, and Foreman died the day after it was announced. When this movie was restored in 1992, their names were added to the credits. Sources claim that the English stage and film actor Charles Lawton was the original choice to play Lieutenant Colonel Nicholson. He turned down the role, claiming that he did not know how to play it convincingly because he didn't understand the motivations of the character. He said he only understood the character after seeing the completed film and Alex Guinness's performance. The other problem that they saw was that the director observed that Lawton was way too big to play the role. He would have had to have lost a lot of weight to be seriously taken as a POW. Sir Lawrence Olivier was offered the part of Nicholson as well, and he turned it down in order to direct The Prince and the Showgirl instead. Olivier said that it was a sensible decision to go off and do love scenes with Marilyn Monroe rather than tough it out in a hot, humid jungle. They also tried to persuade Spencer Tracy to play the role, but Tracy read the book and he told them that that role needs to be played by an Englishman. Alec Guinness initially turned down the role, saying that he couldn't imagine anyone wanting to watch a stiff, upper-lipped British colonel for two and a half hours. Fortunately, he was later on convinced to accept the role. 
The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences voted and awarded Guinness for his performance with an Oscar for Best Actor in the leading role for his portrayal of Lieutenant Colonel Nicholson. Now, initially, when the screenplay was being written, they had in mind Humphrey Bogart to play the role of Shears. But Columbia Pictures head Harry Cohen refused to allow Bogart out of another project. Cary Grant was then briefly considered to star in the role, but his flop in a serious role in the movie Crisis concerned producer Sam Spiegel. Rock Hudson also turned down the role of Shears in order to star in A Farewell to Arms. William Holden was brought into the project to provide box office appeal, but they had to pay for it. He received $300,000 up front and was guaranteed 10% of the share of the profits. The actors Ben Gazzara, Montgomery Clift, and Cliff Robertson were all considered for the role of Lieutenant Joyce. Spiegel finally ended up casting Jeffrey Horn for the role. The eight months of filming began in October of 1956. A preliminary scouting expedition of the real river, Kwai, had shown that it was not suitable for location filming. The river was now nothing more than a trickling stream. The production crew finally settled on a tiny village in what now is known as Sri Lanka. The site was, to say the least, remote. So a compound of bungalows had to be built for the cast and crew. The bridge cost $250,000 to build, and the construction of it actually began before anybody was ever cast for the film. To keep the cost down, the director decided not to hire any extras. Instead, he used crew members and locals from around that area. This meant that some of the British prisoners were actually natives of the region that were wearing makeup to appear Caucasian. Now, the director, David Lean, and the producer, Sam Spiegel, differed greatly on the movie's focus. Lean was more interested in the prison camp rivalry, while Spiegel felt the novel's action and adventure element deserved more of the focus. As I mentioned before, Alec Guinness had some reservations about playing the role of Nicholson. Guinness had become a beloved figure on screen, appearing in a series of popular comedies. The Nicholson character seemed solemn, and maybe even dull. To remedy this, Guinness tried to inject some humor into his portrayal of this character. But Lean wouldn't have any part of it, insisting that the role be played completely straight. And this is what began the argument between the two men that continued through the entire filming of the movie. For the scene where Nicholson emerges from the oven after being confined there several days, Guinness actually based his awkward walk on that of his son Matthew when he was recovering from polio. He later reflected on that scene and called it one of the finest pieces of work that he had ever done. In order to film the four paratroopers jumping from their plane, the director of photography, Jack Hilliard, lashed himself to the wing of the British military airplane, and he shot the jump with a handheld 16mm camera. The paratroopers in the movie were members of the Royal Air Force stationed in Ceylon. Now, there was one point during the filming that the director, David Lean, nearly drowned when he was actually swept away by the river current. And it was actually Jeffrey Horn who gave chase and actually saved his life. Now, the head of Columbia Pictures, Harry Cohen, is just an evil guy as far as I'm concerned. Nobody liked this guy at all. He was considered vulgar and just a tyrant to work for. He was absolutely furious with the script when he saw it, and it didn't have a love interest at all in the script. He thought you can't do a movie without a woman in it. He insisted that they do a rewrite and that the director add a scene where Shears, the American played by William Holden, cozies up to a nurse played by Ann Sears. The filming of the bridge explosion was to be done on March 10, 1957. 
present to view the sequence were the Prime Minister of Ceylon and a group of government dignitaries. On the first take, the explosives on the bridge didn't detonate. They had to actually stop filming. The train actually crossed the bridge safely, only to crash into a generator on the other side of the bridge and was wrecked. It was repaired in time to be blown up the following morning. Again, the Prime Minister and his entourage were present. They used 1,000 pounds of dynamite to blow up the bridge, and it was filmed on five different cameras at the cost of $250,000. This was all for 30 seconds of screen time. The final car on the train contained a push engine to actually ensure that the entire train would fall into the river. The final scene of the movie, the aerial shot of Major Clipton walking away from the scene of the bridge explosion, was the last scene to be shot. The cast and most of the crew, with its equipment and cameras, had already left. David Lean had to use a wind-up 35 millimeter camera to actually shoot the scene. He also had to use a stand-in for actor James Donald, who had already returned home to the UK. Last week, I took the opportunity to sit back and watch this movie once again. It brought back some really fond memories of watching it for the very first time in the theater back in the early 1960s. Thank you so much for watching and we'll continue to chase the classics.